Quick note to my beloved unfuckers heading into the holiday weekend. Many of you have voiced your concerns about my lack of enthusiasm over the election choices. In fact, we've even been blocked from posting or commenting in the unfuckers at all group, a decision that both stings a little bit and uplifts. It stings because this community is truly what fuels my tank. But I can't be upset about a family meeting that's taking place without dad looking over everyone's shoulders, so I totally get it. I'm only posting now to make sure that you're all aware that I'm not turning a blind eye to the comments. I have to say, though, one of the best parts of the Facebook group is the cover photo of Nettie. Now, for those that weren't with us early on, Nettie was a career activist from Wisconsin who didn't take shit from anyone. She was an early listener to the podcast and introduced us to stalwarts like the Knudsen family, Alex S., and the crew over at McFleshman's. And I think of her often. She's among the voices that I have in my head when I'm writing because she had no problem emailing me when there was even a trace of establishment thinking in my writing and telling me to, quote, do better. There's little doubt in my mind that she would be standing on a street corner and out of gamey, denouncing the establishment maneuvers of the Democratic Party to crack down on dissent and refusing to platform Palestinian voices as one example, all in the name of electioneering. And that she would simultaneously be calling out the monstrous policies of the GOP that threatened to dismantle what's left of our fragile society. Maybe that's why I find no friction or conflict in criticizing the corporate class that suffocates the working class with a knee on its neck and a hand in its pocket. Why I can say with complete moral clarity that a vote for Democrats on a single day in November is a just one, as it offers a stay of execution for marginalized voices. A Harris administration serves to protect hormone replacement therapy as an example for trans youth. It offers hope that will extend temporary protected status for Venezuelans fleeing authoritarian rule and economic peril exacerbated by the U.S. sanctions regime. It builds upon the investments into onshore manufacturing jobs in the tech and renewable energy sectors. It maintains the minimum corporate and wealth tax rates that prohibit tax evasion among the 1%. And then, of course, there's the defensive posture that is just as meaningful, if not more so. A Harris administration prevents the GOP from a federally legislated abortion ban. It blocks yet another Supreme Court justice pick in the event there's an opening. A Harris administration prevents the GOP from gutting Medicare and Medicaid and raiding the Social Security Trust. And hopefully, it preserves the efforts of the FTC in its quest to mitigate bad behavior among corporations seeking to sidestep regulations designed to protect us. On this one day, this one day of the year every four years, there is a clear choice, especially during the Trump era. The other 364 days, our job is also clear. It's to hold up a mirror to the reality of the corporate duopoly and the pernicious neoliberal policies that have torn apart the fabric of Bretton Woods, the New Deal, great society programs, and the civil rights movement. Both parties are equally complicit in this process, though their tactics and rhetoric differ substantially. And we've done this work. None of this should come as a surprise. It was Nixon who struck the first blow to Bretton Woods. Reagan who started to tear down the New Deal policies. Clinton who attacked the great society programs. The Bush dynasty that stripped away our civil liberties and terrorized the globe in the name of spreading democracy. The Obama administration, who sided with the banks and the corporate class over the working class and turned the military into an assassination machine. It was the Trump administration who tore off the polite mask of the party system to reveal our worst instincts and to dismantle what remained of the Civil Rights Act. And it was Biden who has been funding the ongoing massacre of innocent civilians in Gaza. The only administration to escape our wrath in the modern era was the Carter administration, though we were certainly critical of the administration's conservative economic positions. So I understand the enthusiasm for an anyone but Biden ticket and the energy around a Kamala Harris presidency, but I'm also excruciatingly aware that a Harris victory is but a momentary glimmer of hope in an otherwise long and painful struggle to put true progressive values and policies back on the table. Now, perhaps the only comment that stuck in my ribs like a serrated knife was one that accused me of holding a privileged cisgender position on criticizing the Democratic Party during an election cycle. Now, my lived experience differs greatly from my journalistic perspective. 
See, my lived experience as a cisgender white male is one of extreme and nearly absolute privilege. My journalistic perspective was cultivated by James Baldwin, Rosa Clemente, Amy Goodman, Bernard Hardcourt, Jeff Charlotte, Hannah Arendt, Angela Davis, John Maynard Keynes, Tama Piketty, Chris Hedges, Noam Chomsky, Cornell West, Jane Mayer, and Jeremy Scahill. It was formed through hundreds of hours spent reporting on Native and Indigenous issues, an experience that gave me a deeper appreciation for the depravity of our institutions and how the smiling and dulcet platitudes of the liberal class that serve corporate masters are often the most dangerous. Hope is a terrible thing to destroy. The road to impoverishment is littered with broken promises and fingers crossed behind the backs of politicians on the dole. More recently, I've been fortunate to collaborate with or just interview Brianna Joy Gray, Nathan Robinson, Danny Bessner, Giannis Varoufakis, Rashid Khalidi, and Ben Burgess. Imagine how all of these great minds, from Baldwin and Arendt to Khalidi and Varoufakis, and yes, to Nettie McGee, would interpret current events. They are the sum of my biases. White cisgender male privilege is breathing a sigh of relief that the less capable establishment Democrat dropped out of the race to make way for a younger establishment Democrat who has the energy and momentum to win the election. Trust me, the system that we have now is designed entirely for my comfort and advantage even more so than a Trump system that would tear the country apart at the seams. Propping up the liberal establishment is perhaps the most privileged position a cisgender white male could take because it maintains our economic status and legal privilege and assuages our guilt. Nettie never settled for the scraps that fell from the table, and so neither will I. And to be clear, as a white cisgender male, I'm sitting at the fucking table. Just some thoughts as we head into the weekend.